so let's start off with quick like 15 second intros as in who are you what do you do yeah i'm martin uh found co-founder of gnosis prediction market platform you do other things though <laughs> 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 well uh, that is uh, prediction market platforms are a rabbit hole <laughs> so if you start doing that you have to do a lot of other things <laughs> But I'm Lane. Uh, I'm an Ethereum core developer, primarily focused on a project called Ewasm, and also like very hands-on with Ethereum governance. I am Adan from Stampery, and now from WinNet Foundation, we are creating a decentralized Oracle network for providing data trustlessly into smart contracts. My name is Jutta. I'm CEO and co-founder of Parity. Um, before that, I was responsible for security for Ethereum prior to launch and also immediately afterwards. So I like to encourage debate. So I've told, I've told our panelists to, uh, to feel free to disagree with one another. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see whether that happens, respectfully, of course. Um, but before we get to that, uh, I'd like to you know, talk about why. Um, it gives context for everybody's opinions. Uh, so um, I'm curious to each of you personally, like, why do you choose to work on Web3? I, I, I might start with a, a boring answer. Uh, so, so, I mean, you can have a lot of, um, well, kind of high ideals, uh, and I hope I have <laughs> some of them and so on, and you know, involved in basic income stuff and whatever, but I, I would still like to, for, for Gnosis, the answer is very boring. And the answer is purely uh, to make it more attractive uh, for others uh, to build on top. Th that, that's all. That's I, I, I would say that's all. So. We're trying to build a platform. We're trying uh, to reach network effects with this platform. And uh, we think, well, you could have, uh, you could try to build a monopoly where you can completely c control the thing and have the, the, the old web and have all the network effects. Um, uh, first, it's hard to get there <laughs> to, 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 to do that. <laughs> uh, and second, it sucks for other reasons. But uh, even if you kind of don't care about any ethics and whatever, you just like try to maximize your chances to reach that status, well, it might be easier to give up uh, power and to give up control uh, to make it more attractive for others uh, to build on top. So you not do something that you fully control and then others are dependent on you, but instead you deploy your stuff on well, Web3 and others have strong guarantees that if they build on top, um, they will not get screwed by the platform operator. I guess my, the short version of my story is that I had a very traditional career on Wall Street for a while. I worked in finance and then kind of from there changed gears and became um, bas basically decided that I wanted to focus on innovation because I think that sort of creating value is, is, uh, um, does a lot of good for the world and I could contribute to that. Redemption, basically. Sorry? Redemption, basically. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, so I had, so prior to Ethereum, I had a healthcare technology startup and um, worked on it for, for a few years, and it was just an incredibly frustrating process. It kind of felt like banging my head against the wall because it was the antithesis of everything that Web3 stands for. It's, it's just sort of a lot of vested interests and a lot of rent seeking and, and you know, networks that don't talk to each other and don't exchange data, et cetera. Uh, so when I discovered Ethereum and Web3, um, I said, wow, this is, this is sort of the uh, opportunity to innovate the way that, that I want to and the way that I think will, will change the world. And of course, from there, it's grown and blossomed. And like now I believe that you know, we have these institutions that are really struggling to keep up with technology and even things like nation states, right? And I think that Web3 um, is a big part of how we uh, build a better future, basically. For me, in my case, uh, for as long as, uh, as I've been working in technology, uh, decentralization was always my thing, let's say. Uh, I've been working for 10 years in De developing different uh, communication uh, protocols, peer-to-peer -peer protocols, XMPP, MQTT, and 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 it, it was not that I made a movement from that area into crypto. It was just uh, like a natural shift towards this space because at the end of the day, it's the plain uh, realization of everything I had been uh, working before. And, and that's why <laughs> I'm so excited uh, about it. It was a lucky encounter. Um, I think, yeah, as part of a journey, like recognizing what's, what's going wrong online about like 
five years ago or so when Reddit still was like really good discussions and whatnot. Um, and like five years ago, it was Snowden revelations and, and I was sort of looking for steps I could take myself like on a more every day to day basis, like how I could behave online differently. So looking for a solution to how to share data in a more encrypted um, decentral way and stumbled across a conversation. And I mean, it wasn't in that way like a decision, but as I said, a lucky, um, lucky encounter around the time when, um, when Ethereum was, I don't know, POC three, four, something like that. Um, and when, when Gav had sort of added that twist to Ethereum that it should become that decentralized applications platform, so uh, that backbone to Web3. So my next question is, when you got to Ethereum, when was it? You've just answered, of course. And, and what was your biggest pain point in the stack? And, and we can keep going down the line, or we can <laughs> jumble all up as well, if, if anybody wants to go first. I think back then, when I joined, it was, so they were looking for somebody to look after security also integration. I mean, people mainly discussing Bitcoin were really skeptical that whether Ethereum would even work, and if so, like, would it be secure? So finding actually the right people to look after, to help like making it secure and launching it. And um, that was sort of the, the topics back then. When Ethereum was uh, starting, I was working on Stampery, which was a, a certification platform using um, public blockchains. So at that time, the only main one was Bitcoin, of course. But we, we, we realized that Ethereum has had uh, and has a very good potential to become a, a very uh, relevant um, public blockchain. And we integrated um, Ethereum at the time. And, and it, it was really challenging at first because it, it was quite much more complex than what we, what, what they, when compared with the experience that we had uh, with working with, with Bitcoin, but at the same time, it was, let's say, palatable or accessible in the sense that uh, it's, it, it, there, there was clearly an intention to make it approachable by, uh, to web developers and people who don't necessarily come from uh, system development. And, and the way that we finally uh, figured out how to integrate it was by making um, stateless contracts. So those are contract calls that are not calling actually a contract because the important thing for us is just creating uh, proof of existence and proof of integrity of data. So publishing hashes on the, on the blockchain. And you don't really need to sort the hashes into, into the chain because Anyway, everyone has all the entire story of transactions. So the, tra the transactions are the mutations on the state. So you don't need to modify the state. You just need to make it written on the transactions log. And, 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 for, and for us, at that point, the most difficult uh, thing and the main pain point f was for sure lack of tooling, lack of uh, static analytics uh, tools um, and not very helpful compiler, but those are things that <laughs> that we have been uh, seeing how they have evolved and how they are uh, how everyone is making a really really great uh, job improving that, and we are we are really excited ab about where all of this is, is going to. M maybe building on, on, on top. Um, well, I, I could go through the different iterations, like how we started and, 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 and how, how, how the thing uh, evolved. We had like first version two weeks after Frontier Live, yeah, somewhat years, yeah. on and, and, and so on. But I think fundamentally, um, uh, and behind all the layers and so on, but one fundamental question, which I still think the answer is still not 100% clear is, what belongs on chain and what not. <laughs> so it's very, very, very simple. So uh, you start in the very first iteration, naively you put everything on chain, and you, uh, you, you see the privacy issues, the cost issues. So still, uh, may, may it's kind of an open question. 
uh, one, one way to, to answer this question is roughly an estimation uh, about the transaction cost. So will a transaction uh, on Ethereum, let's say 200,000 gas, that's maybe a kind of uh, average transaction for something that's more than a simple, simple uh, value transfer, 200,000 gas in two or three years, will that be like one cent, the tenth of a cent, will it be one dollar, will it be ten dollar, will it be hundred dollar? So kind of depending on, on which order of magnitude uh, you are, that will define what is on chain. So is on chain just like once in a while a hash update that then represents a full kind of other state uh, somewhere here? Or are if, if, if you could have an answer to that question, um, then that way would, would make all the develop the daily uh, decisions uh, much easier. Well, let's come to consensus right now. What belongs on chain and what doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> Easy question, right? We can do that. We just had three days of meetings in <laughs> California <laughs> discussing this, the concept of whether we need some sort of form of state rent or something and what that would mean and how do we put the right economic incentives in place. I would say the jury's still out on that question, but I, I think we're coming together. What's your guess? What's your opinion? I, I mean, I, I think part of the answer is kind of goes back to what you said about fees, right? It's, it's not so much like, one way to answer what the question. One way to answer the question is you want to put as much on chain as you can, as long as it's still affordable to do right, that. Right. But the flip side is we don't want people to use Ethereum as their personal hard drive, right? So if you if we have economics that make sense, then we'll let the market sort it out. That, but we don't have that today. So yeah, I think that's the, that's the thing, right? I mean, it's so sort of similar. It's not as constructive as a question. It's not that constructive, like similar to asking, or oh, is it is it good that. Bitcoin uses proof of work, work like uh, as long as there's no alternative, like you have to ask that question, but better spend your time on like making it better and more scalable and interoperable instead of like wasting your time sort of <laughs> finding the best answer right now now. Um. I can just give like guesses I, I have. I, my, my guess would be that um, with, uh, or in, in, in some way the question can be rephrased to how much will it cost and that defines then how what belongs on chain. Uh, and my guess is that hopefully um, uh, with sharding we can, what my, my guess is what we will see is very different prices on very different charts. So I could imagine that uh, the gas prices uh, within the charts or maybe within um, uh, what's called in Polkadot zone? Parachains. Parachains in Polkadot uh, will be of two or three uh, orders of magnitude different, so like factor 100 or 1,000, uh, because, um, well, you solve, in a way, you solve scalability uh, with, with sharding or par parachains and having those things uh, in parallel, but you only solve it to the extent that... Um, well, you, you of course lose the atomicity or do doing things atomically. Uh, so within one chain or within within one chart, within one parachain, you can uh, across shards you can't. So kind of the mental picture I have. Well, you have uh, in 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 the New United States you have uh, New York City and their square meter is very very expensive and but but there is this density and you want to be there because others are there. Uh, and um, that will be with one chart. There will be maybe the highest value transactions, the, the big exchanges, and you want to be on that chart because um, for, for some reasons. But if your application is not that connected to, to or is not that interested in that, it's totally fine to be on a on on, on somewhere in the in the Midwest, uh, in the nowhere, and have your own uh, well land or chart where where transactions are very cheap. And there you can do much more things on chain than on in New York State or in New York City. So you, you jumped to one of my questions in the future, which was about ETH2. Um, but because earlier when we were talking about on-chain versus off-chain, it, it almost seemed like we did sort of come to a consensus about, like, because we aren't talking about on-chain or off-chain, what we lack is really good layer two dev tooling. Um, so I guess, um, yeah. I had a question in there, and then I forgot <laughs> it. <laughs> Anybody want to react to that? Yes. I think that Save in, me. In, in addition to performance or cost or latency when talking about whether we need sharding or any of these uh, parachains or these structures, uh, we need to have an another consideration which is privacy because maybe it's not very uh, desirable to have every transaction recorded in perpetuity, not only for reasons of, as I said, of performance or disk space, but also because of 
privacy. Maybe there uh, there's a lot of data that is being leak leaked there, and we can do nothing about it. So <laughs> second layer solutions make a lot of sense from my standpoint for that reason. I, I think our conception of blockchain is evolving very rapidly as well. And in some sense, you see this as you know, Bitcoin is blockchain iteration evolution one and Ethereum as two and Polkadot and other projects as version three. Um, when, when, when I conceive of Ethereum, like I think early on, we thought of it as this global computer, right? So what does a computer have? A computer has a processor, a computer has disk, right? So we can kind of throw a bunch of stuff at it. Um, I think there's kind of maybe going forward both a minimalist and a maximalist view. I think that the maximalist view is kind of what I just described, like do as much at layer one as you can. But what I find more and more appealing is a minimalist view, which actually says that a blockchain at the highest level can be reduced to nothing more than a set of like Merkle roots. And everything else can go at layer two or beyond. Hmm. Um, and I think that you know, as, as technologies like, like CK Snarks and Starks and stuff evolve and we can sort of compress more technology, um, we can kind of approach this minimalist view, which I think benefits privacy as well. Yeah. So I guess I'll switch gears a little bit, which is uh, ask a question, which comes first, the apps or the infrastructure? <laughs> and, and put differently, really, this is a question about, um, like, should we prioritize adoption? Like, do we, do we want to get people out there using this stuff as much as we can right now? Or do, do we want to be, you know, making it possible for this wave of the future? Um, and yeah, I if we do want to prioritize, how do we do prioritize adoption? So given the state of the technology, I would say the main purpose is still to make development easy, like dev to whatever, like dev tooling. I mean, just looking back on how the internet evolved, it's really early and we've seen that with the crypto kitties, like you, you face scalability issues and whatnot. So, but I'm, I'm very confident that if we focus on making things easy for developers, like that's the fastest way to adoption. Totally agree, but this this uh, kind of discussion between our first architecture or first adoption, maybe it's a little fake because maybe it's a process that happens organically and at the same time, and one drives the other because we I if we have adoption, early adoption, even if it's it feels clunky, it feels uh, disastrous or weird like the crypto kitties it makes our flaws as a, as designers of these systems evident and also helps us focus on what to work on what 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 are the uh priorities for the end users and yeah yeah it's like real time feedback and that's that's super important because otherwise we it's it's impossible for us to to think of every every single use case we we don't know what are the trade-offs for for everyone so if we want to build if we want ethereum or web3 more generally to become a world computer we we really need to take into account all those use cases and it's impossible that a single uh, on-chain system can fit all of them and and yeah that's why I would say we we, we at least uh, view it very um, pragmatically, so uh, well, scalability and, and costs are, are still a very well, big factor. So Ethereum is running since uh, m more than a year basically at capacity, so I mean the, the blocks are full. So that means if you, if you want to have more adoption for your dApp, you in a way have to outprice uh, other dApps. <laughs> That's just a uh, reality. So, um, so um, roughly, I, I think we can right now with Ethereum. Or our internal thinking is: uh, Does the thing make sense on Ethereum if transaction costs for two hundred thousand gas transaction is a dollar? And if it's if it's if it's uh, if it doesn't make sense with a dollar for one transaction, it currently I would say uh, it's not worth kind of trying to get it. I mean, it's still worth building. Or like showing it and having having the plans for layer two and so on, but but trying to drive adoption for something on Ethereum on chain and kind of trying to get more users, in my view, it doesn't make sense if if it can't like uh, um, work with 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 that uh, piece. 
I think the other, I mean, I think there are two more things that are worth spending time on. One is like the, like what, what, what will the business models be like that actually save us from the surveillance capitalism that we're in right now? And I think that's a question worth contemplating again and again because we'll have different answers as the technology comes comes together and it's to me like you asked about like why did I choose to be in this space like that's the that's the key question like how do we design this and how do we how do we ensure we don't end up with something we didn't want <laughs> so I, I think um, like ethereum and web3 in general have been built in a very sort of technology forward technology first fashion up to now and I think that that's a product of kind of the the minds that went into creating it um, it's it sort of, I mean, we've, we've heard this term science experiment thrown around a few times. Like, I certainly still call Ethereum a science experiment. Uh, and, and so I think, but, but we have to, at the same time, we have to own that, you know, that we're in this place right now where we have this platform that kind of works and the tooling and infrastructure are getting better, but we don't have any apps that anyone's using. Like, really, right? We need to, like, stop and reflect for a moment and look at that. Um, like, the, the most widely used apps today are still, you know, hundreds of active users per day or per week or something, right? They're very, very small numbers. Um, especially if you ex exclude things like exchanges, you know? Um, and, and on the one hand, I think that that's terrible and we should all be very scared about that and we should be talking about it and we should sort of um, make sure that we're putting users and use cases first, especially along the lines that Utah was mentioning. You know, how do we build things that respond to surveillance capitalism and get to feature parity? On the other hand, maybe we don't need to freak out about it because it is really early. Um, and, and I think that there's a bit of iteration back and forth like you guys were talking about, right? We're in an infrastructure phase right now, so if we're building heads down, that's okay. So we talked a little bit about, you know, sort of choosing whether to put it on layer one or layer two. Is there any particular piece of infrastructure or tooling that is you, that you either consider a glaring need that you personally have in, in your project or that you see out there that hasn't been built built yet? One one uh, tool I still are waiting for is just a simple. No, it's not simple, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, proof of data avail availability uh, solution. So uh, kind of a blockchain or whatever it is, but a, a tool where it, it does nothing else uh, other than uh, like asserting data availability, even for like um, like a specific time frame, might, might be as short as 24 hours. So you can just come, come to con consensus this data or like data representing this hash uh, was available or is available. Um, and that alone would make uh, many, many layer two uh, uh, scaling uh, uh, solutions uh, much more uh, easy to build. Um, I hope that will come at some point. I think we're still missing a lot, and I think we need to own that as well. You know, I think that the initial promise of Web3 was storage, compute, and messaging. Right, and we like kind of, sort of have compute, but like we don't have compelling storage, which is exactly what you were saying. We we haven't solved basic issues around data availability. We don't really have a functional messaging layer yet. You know, there's a couple of teams working on that. Web three foundation status are working on it. We have Whisper, which the Ethereum foundation is working on. Um, also, I'll just throw out governance. <laughs> this is an issue at layer one and layer two. I don't think we've figured that one out yet. UX UI. I love the work that Taylor's doing with my crypto. Like, I think there's a lot of things we need to work out, especially if we believe that a lot more will happen on the user side, or if not, like what, what will the trade-offs look like and what do we feel happy to delegate in the end, maybe to like sort of trust that the parties that are more transparent than they are these days and what all this infrastructure should look like. I feel forced to say that the, the most important missing part and the biggest pain point for uh, many Ethereum developers is the lack of yeah some proof of availability so some way to get knowledge from outside the blockchain and to prove that something was there in that minute in time something so simple as a data point from an api i'm not asking about physical world or or more complex uh realities but just resolving uh this little problem between the undeterministic web and the deterministic world of smart contracts. And that's exactly what <laughs> why we started with WitNet. I think to all the sort of smart 
uh, hackers out there in the world looking for fun, interesting, meaningful problems to work on. There's a very rich set of problems here that we're <laughs> describing. So like, please come to hackathons and like hack on this stuff with us. We, we need a lot of help. So let's go back to something you said, Lane, which was uh, about governance as a part of, of infrastructure. So where does governance fit in, because given where we are here, right? Where does governance fit into the infrastructure of Web3? That's a zinger. That's a really hard question. <laughs> I'm not a governance expert. <laughs> I mean, I'll just start by saying that there are many schools of thought, right? There are as many sort of opinions on this as there are like people in the room. I think that some people and projects feel quite strongly that governance belongs at layer one, right? So if you look at um, projects like Tezos, they're doing really awesome, exciting kind of work in that space. Um, I think Polkadot has a very different perspective on, on governance. And I sort of think that some of the, some of the, it's partially on-chain governance and there's partial upgradability, which is great. Most of Ethereum up to this point has been on the other side, which is kind of like keep everything off chain, although not everyone feels that strongly. So yeah, many perspectives. I can see it and, and I can perfectly understand that there, there's value, there's intrinsic value, both in having projects, networks, uh, platforms that have no governance at all, just like Bitcoin, for example, there's value in that. That's, that's a feature, not a flaw. And and I can perfectly realize that the other way it's it's important to it's there's intrinsic value in protocols platforms that can be in, can, that can be upgraded by by their users by their ecosystem so it, it's it's a matter of trade-offs of uh, discovering with what makes sense for every particular uh, case. I, I can just say like my my favorite solution would be. Uh, Ethereum needs some um, well, some more significant changes. Um, well, proof of stake, obviously, uh, proof uh, sharding, and definitely like something around rent or like being being sustainable. So I think those, in, in my view, those things are necessary, and those are changes that need to, to be made. And currently, yeah, the, the process is this wake vague uh, off chain process, like uh, as it as it is. But my wish would be that Ethereum after that, uh, like transition uh, would become more like uh, like Bitcoin, something that is a very, very st stable um, foundation that doesn't uh, change a lot. And then, or kind of the changes are really minimal. Uh, and then, uh, but it's it's good enough to build then those, those systems uh, on top. So stuff like Aragon, stuff like uh, other DAOs uh, that, that, that can have well, dispute or upgrade mechanisms or dispute resolution mechanisms. You, you can kind of really experiment then with, with different governance uh, processes in parallel, Fuja Key and many more. Yeah, my favorite solution is experimentation on that level, like just be because we just don't know and it's so yeah. crucial for the long term su success to make it easy to upgrade, like just be open about um, what different ways there are and also just beyond what, like what we narrowly think we could do, like be aware how much manipulation can happen through social media and like all the things we've seen with, with voting in the last few years. I think, yeah, again, the, the, the attitude in Ethereum since the beginning has really been unstructured, non sort of formalized governance, nothing on chain, et cetera. But it, just to give a very concrete example, right, I want to point out that like we're beginning in some ways to brush up against the limits of that way of doing things, right? We're really, really, as I'm sure many of you are aware, like really struggling to add even like relatively simple changes to Ethereum. Um, so, you know, while in general, I believe in keeping the base layer as simple as possible and pushing things to layer two, like you're describing, I think Aragon's a great example of what can be done with governance at layer two. Uh, you need something at layer one and we haven't figured that out yet. Well, I think I want to throw that ball around so <laughs> I was going to open it up for Q&A. Did it not get broken earlier? Oh, did it get broken? Oh, well, then maybe I should go back to asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a question? Anybody? Give one, one over there. Yeah? Oh, you have a mic. Here. Whoa, this is cool. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, how are you going to go about figuring that out? I think, and who is going to be involved in that process? And if you don't know, just how would you want to maybe start? You're talking about the process of Determining governing. Determining governance for layer one, yeah. Jeez, that is such a hard question. Um, I mean, I think 
so just to restate the question, right, how, like how should we go about, it's a meta question, right? Not how do we govern it, but how do we figure out how to govern it? Exactly. Which I agree is like sort of the, the trillion dollar question at the moment. I, I, I think the short answer for me, I think, I think this is what you said a moment ago, is experimentation, right? Like I think we need to run like a thousand different experiments because we just don't know, right? We need to sort of own the fact that this is new, it hasn't been done before, there are different schools of thought. Um, it's hard to say what that means, right? Like one thing it could mean is forks that have different sort of governance um, policies in place. Uh, maybe we have parallel tracks with the Ethereum, existing Ethereum governance process, like the EIP process or something. Uh, just generally, I think we need way more dialogue and debate about it. We need to get a lot more um, people into that conversation because it's just been this tiny group of um, brilliant, but like very narrowly focused kind of technical minds up to now. So like, again, like all of you guys out there, we're really like, I'm, I'm personally, I have this personal mission to like decentralize Ethereum governance. So like, come talk to me about it. <laughs> and I mean, you can like, just looking back on the, on what we, how we've seen technology evolving over time. Like when, when Ethereum was built, like and that concept of gas was introduced, everybody thought like that would be a great idea because that would make a dynamic market. But in the end, like nobody was that like, uh, adaptive and agile as we would have thought and so in the end you have to put it put it in, out there deploy it and see how people react to that I think psychology is so difficult that you can theorize a lot without getting anywhere this is one of the things that excites me the most about projects like polka dot is that it's sort of and cosmos and other projects right is that it's by definition a bundle of experiments right you're just going to kind of create this marketplace of dozens or hundreds of of chains um, and, and see kind of what works and what doesn't and what sort of fee markets evolve and where kind of apps and users migrate. I think that that's what we need to be doing. Mm. One experiment in, in this direction is, um, uh, yeah, a, a DAO we are, we are starting uh, called the DX DAO and trying, uh, it, it, at least one attempt to try to create a DAO and therefore like a, a kind of formal, formalized uh, governance process with hopefully as many uh, Ethereum stakeholders uh, involved uh, as possible. So the, the way to participate, there, there will be kind of no pre-allocation of um, voting rights, but instead uh, you get it by just locking down, for example, Ether or a, a range of ESC20 tokens. So it's, it's not perfect, but it's definitely, it will be hopefully the first uh, kind of formalized governance process where at least 10, 15, uh, kind of bigger players or projects are involved, and, and of course, like anyone who cares. Um, so I'll let's see how <laughs> what, what, what that will produce. So uh, maybe then this, uh, uh, but, but that's kind of far away. But in theory, uh, it, at some point, it could like internally vote on EIPs. W whether that is then kind of whether that counts or not, that that's a fully dis uh, different discussion. But it's kind of just one more tool to to play around. Signals are really important. We definitely need signals. I, mean, I really want to throw this thing. So. Are you really going to let me try? Yeah. Is it, is it not that expensive? <laughs> 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 Good catch. No look catch. Not bad. <laughs> Anybody have a question? Here we go. All right. So do I throw this like a football? I don't know. We'll find out. Ooh. Almost. Don't, quit, don't quit your day job, Evan. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a yeah. soccer player. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what do you guys think uh, is Ethereum developing too slowly? Uh, in my view, I mean, <laughs> I run software development for a while now, and uh, the Constantinople takes forever to go live, and we have much more important releases that are still to come up until the initial, even the initial vision is realized. Um, the blockchain space is very comp getting very competitive, and if Ethereum is to survive, it has to kind of, in my view, it has to speed up. What do you guys think? Is, it, is that speed good or, uh, I know it's justified to a certain extent, but is it good or it needs to be better? Who wants to move slower? <laughs> Who wants I guess to move I can faster? This one. Um, I mean, like, with, like, life is all about trade-offs and blockchains are all about trade-offs and we have many dilemmas and trilemmas, right? So I think, um, like, early on, Ethereum was very much about move fast and break things. And for better or for worse, we now find ourselves in a place where every time 
we change something or add something, even something very, very minor, like in the example of Constantinople, right, we, we're trying to sort of slightly reduce the gas cost for something. Uh, we're now suddenly in a place where we're breaking many invariants that we didn't even know existed and we're violating a social mm -hmm. contract and people are getting mad at us and there's all sorts of possibilities for um, cascading second and third order effects and contracts breaking and things. So, you know, again, two sides to the coin, right? One side is for Ethereum to succeed, it needs to kind of continue to move fast and break things and innovate and be kind of the anti-Bitcoin. But I think another way of looking at it, which goes back to something that Martin said earlier, is that the base layer should be stable and simple um, and reliable, and we should try to push as much innovation as possible into layer two. But I think you also said that that's sort of a future goal, right? So I, th I think my personal perspective is yes, it's not moving fast enough today, but we want it to okay. get to a place where it doesn't need to move so fast. I, I mean, I, m m I would say, um, well, I, I don't believe in proof of work, <laughs> so I, I would say any, any uh, um, uh, proof of work is not long term, uh, cannot long term survive uh, without at least without uh, substantial um, subsidy of um, well issuing new tokens, and, and and even then it will be, in my view, outcompeted by uh, by something else. So I, I would just like to really see the changes necessary to make sure the thing can survive a uh, long time, um, well and then hopefully stabilize. And we are unfortunately not there yet. But hope hopefully we'll be there soon. We sort of have a roadmap. Yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Well, so we are out of time. Uh, so. Thank you to all our panelists. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>